Preface of the Life of Rev. Henry Martin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Rev. Henry Martin. Written for the American Sunday School Union by John Hall. With some account of Abdul Masih, a Hindu convert. Preface. This volume has been principally compiled from the tenth English edition of the Memoirs of Mr. Martin, by the Rev. John Sargent. The author of the present publication has endeavoured to present his subject in a manner which may not mislead the young in forming their estimate of Christian character, and to propose the humble missionary as an imitable example rather than an object of vague and curious admiration. To effect this design he has avoided, as much as possible, the use of terms of personal eulogy, in hopes that the perusal of the biography will leave upon the youthful reader a deeper impression of the indispensable need of divine power to enable any creature to live a useful and holy life. Children are taught, at least by implication, to believe that the eminent instances of piety and zeal, which are recorded both in sacred and ordinary history, are exceptions to the doctrine of Christ, who directed his disciples to say, even after they should have done, all these things which were commanded, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. This course is likely not only to create an illusion which more mature knowledge will but imperfectly dissipate, but to diminish the splendor of the single example of perfect righteousness which has blessed our world. Its tendency, moreover, is to foster that hidden corruption of religious vanity in the heart of the young Christian which usually needs no extraneous aid to assist it in impeding the growth of grace. It would seem that the memoirs of a Christian should be rather adapted to instruct the living than to applaud the dead, and it is surprising that so few works of the kind are extant, prepared with evangelical discrimination. It is especially important that this principle should be regarded in biographies designed for pupils in Sunday schools, and it would be a new honour to the institution if the productions in this department which claim their patronage should be marked by this rare moral distinction. End of preface. Chapter One of the Life of Rev. Henry Martin by John Hall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The father of Henry Martin was a workman in the tin mines of Cornwall in England. As the miners worked very deep in the earth, shut out from the light of the sun, and breathing an unwholesome air, it was their custom to labour four hours, and then to spend the same length of time in resting. During these hours of rest, John Martin devoted himself to improving his education, which had been very slight and by his industrious application he soon became so well acquainted with arithmetic that he was at length engaged as clerk by a merchant in the town of Truro, in the county of Cornwall. The conduct of this man is an example to all persons whose occupations afford them any leisure. There is scarcely any one who is so constantly occupied as not to have some time in the week for the improvement of his mind. Had John Martin made no exertion to supply his want of early instruction, he would probably have wasted his life in the miserable toil of digging ore in the unwholesome depths of the mines. But by employing his spare time in learning, instead of wasting it in idleness and intemperance, he was soon enabled to maintain his family respectably, and to save his children from the evils of ignorance by giving them a good education. Henry, his third child, the subject of this volume was born at Truro on the 18th of February, 1781, and before he was eight years old was put under the charge of an excellent schoolmaster. At school he was remarkable for the gentleness of his disposition, yet he was not a general favourite with his schoolfellows, as, owing to the mildness of his spirit, he was not inclined to engage in their sports, and was fond of quiet. After spending seven years at this school, his father sent him to the city of Oxford, hoping that he would be admitted as a student in one of the colleges of the celebrated university at that place, and be supported by funds which are raised for that purpose, called scholarships. 
From the boys who apply for admission on these terms, the most promising scholars are selected. But Henry had not been very studious, and though some of his examiners were in favor of electing him, he did not succeed. He afterwards considered this failure as a great mercy, for had he been thrown, when not fifteen years of age, into the evil company which he would then have met with at college, he might have become dissolute beyond recovery. He returned to his school, and remained under the same teacher, until he entered St. John's College, in the University of Cambridge, in October 1797. Ambitious to be distinguished, and anxious to gratify his father, he applied himself diligently to study during his stay in college. He was moral and amiable in his conduct, excepting that his temper, which was usually very mild, was sometimes irritated to an improper degree, and led him, as unrestrained passions always lead those who indulge them, to hasty and dangerous conduct. Excellent as his outward character was, it was not so because he was anxious to fulfill his duty to God, who requires purity of heart and life from all his intelligent creatures. And he was so insensible at this time to the fact that God most justly claims that every being should live to his glory, that he thought it a very strange doctrine when a pious friend told him that he ought to attend to his studies, not for the sake of gaining praise from man, but that he might be the better qualified to promote the glory of God. He could not, however, but acknowledge that it was entirely reasonable, and determined that he would hold and maintain this opinion, but never once meant that it should govern his conduct. Of course, his holding a correct opinion, without acting accordingly, was worth nothing, and only increased his sinfulness, as he continued to follow his own ambition, after he was convinced that God rightfully claimed all his services. Thus, Many persons are well acquainted with the history, doctrines, and commands of the Holy Scriptures, who do not live according to what they require, and aggravate their guilt, because they sin willfully after knowing the truth. And thus, many believe all that is in the Scriptures, as they believe what is written in other books. But that belief or faith only is of any value to a man, which causes him to receive the truth in his heart, as well as in his memory to live according to its requirements, and to obey the commandment, Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is just as binding on the whole human family as any of the Ten Commandments which were given at Sinai. The great desire of Martin's heart was to excel at college, and to be foremost in his class, and this ambition occupied his mind so entirely that he lived without God and as if the world had been created for his honor, instead of the Maker's. His wishes and aims were all selfish. He envied and even hated those who, by greater industry or talents, attained to more distinction than he could reach, whilst in his pride he considered himself superior to all, and professed to regard them with contempt. These unholy feelings were so much increased by his disappointment in not gaining as high honors as he aspired to, that upon a visit to his home during a vacation, he used disrespectful language to his father when he would express opinions differing from his own. When he became a penitent and looked back to this period, he exclaimed, Oh, what an example of patience and mildness was he! I love to think of his excellent qualities, and it is frequently the anguish of my heart that I ever could be so base and wicked as to pain him by the slightest neglect. O oh, my God and Father, why is not my heart doubly agonized at the remembrance of all my transgressions against Thee, ever since I have known Thee as such? During this same visit, which was the last time he saw his father, his pious sister often spoke to him on the subject of religion, but he confessed that the sound of the gospel, thus tenderly accompanied by the admonitions of a sister, was grating to his ears yet he could not escape the conviction that she spoke the truth when she urged its claims upon him. But then it required him to sacrifice his selfish ambition, and this was too dear an object to give up. He promised to read the Bible, but when he reached college his studies filled all his thoughts. 
notwithstanding the fact which he afterwards acknowledged that during his stay at home the wickedness of his heart rose to a greater height than at any other time yet the change which soon afterwards took place in him seems to have been connected with the peculiar state of his circumstances and feelings at that period at an examination after his return to college his ambition attained its object and he was pronounced first in his class a few weeks afterwards he received information of the sudden death of his father this was a great affliction to him and was more severe as it happened in the midst of his triumph and brought to his remembrance the acts of filial disrespect which his evil passions had led him so lately to commit finding that in this state of mind he could take no pleasure in his usual studies he resorted to his bible under the impression that its perusal would be more suitable to his present feelings in this new direction of his inquiries he was encouraged by his pious friend at college and commenced reading luke's narrative of the acts of the apostles as the most entertaining part of the new testament this led him gradually to examine the doctrines of those holy men and the duty of religion in the circumstances of his affliction made this much of an impression that he began to use prayers and to formally ask for pardon though he had little sense of his sinfulness his heart was evidently softened by the occurrence of his father's death and the admonitions and prayers of his sister with the convictions of his own judgment disposed him to pay attention to the subject from which he was not violently drawn away as formerly by his pursuit of fame having now reached the highest station to which he could attain in his class but his pride caused him to shrink from the humility which every sinner must feel before he can come to the saviour so little did he yet know his own heart for the man who truly feels the condition in which he stands in the sight of a supreme being infinitely great infinitely holy infinitely just against whose laws and mercy and goodness he has sinned without excuse cannot but be humble when he becomes acquainted with his true character such was the apparent commencement of the influence of the holy spirit on martin's heart and although on his return to cambridge those sacred impressions were in danger of being destroyed by his diligent application to the study of mathematics which once more threatened to engage his whole attention yet the divine mercy preserved him in the trial some passages in a letter written to his sister at this period show that religion must have entered into his daily thoughts and that he was already brought to see the reasonableness and beauty of spiritual devotion what a blessing it is for me that i have such a sister as you my dear s who have been so instrumental in keeping me in the right way when i consider how little human assistance you have had and the great knowledge to which you have attained on the subject of religion especially observing the extreme ignorance of the most wise and learned of this world i think this is itself a proof of the wonderful influence of the holy ghost on the minds of well-disposed persons it is certainly by the spirit alone that we can have the will or power or knowledge or confidence to pray and by him alone we come unto the father through jesus christ through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father how i rejoice to find that we disagreed only about words i did not doubt as you suppose at all about that joy which true believers feel can there be any one subject any one source of cheerfulness and joy at all to be compared with the heavenly serenity and comfort which such a person must find in holding communion with his god and saviour in prayer in addressing god as his father and more than all in the transporting hope of being preserved unto everlasting life and of singing praises to his redeemer when the time shall be no more oh i do indeed feel this state of mind at times but at other times i feel quite humbled at finding myself so cold and hard-hearted that reluctance to prayer that unwillingness to come unto god who is the fountain of all good when reason and experience tell us that with him only true pleasure is to be found seem to be owing to satanic influence after mentioning that his mathematical studies required such deep thought as to exclude for the time every other subject from the mind and that they were on this account very dangerous to him 
he speaks in the same letter of the beginning of his religious feelings. After the death of our father, you know I was extremely low-spirited, and, like most other people, began to consider seriously, without any particular determination, that invisible world to which he has gone, and to which I must one day go. Yet I still read the Bible unenlightened, and said a prayer or two rather through terror of a superior power than from any other cause. Soon, however, I began to attend more diligently to the words of our Saviour in the New Testament, and to devour them with delight. When the offers of mercy and forgiveness were made so freely, I supplicated to be made partaker of the covenant of grace, with eagerness and hope, and thanks be to the ever-blessed Trinity for not leaving me without comfort. Throughout the whole, however, even when the light of divine truth was beginning to dawn on my mind, I was not under that great terror of future punishment, which I now see plainly I had every reason to feel. I look back now upon that course of wickedness which, like a gulf of destruction, yawned to swallow me up, with a trembling delight, mixed with shame at having lived so long in ignorance and error and blindness. I could say much more, but I have no more room. I have only to express my acquiescence in most of your opinions, and to join with you in gratitude to God for his mercies to us. May he preserve you and me and all of us to the day of the Lord. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of the Life of Rev. Henry Martin by John Hall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Still the desire of applause and the ambition of distinction as a scholar, that great temptation of ardent youth, kept him from making much progress in the infinitely more important study of divine truth. His heart was still destitute of humility and he was not yet sensible of the real vanity of human pursuits. This lesson, however, the providence of God taught him in the manner which, of all others, would make the deepest impression on such a mind as his. It was not until he received the highest honors of college, in January 1801, that he felt that temporal gratifications cannot satisfy the desires of the soul. I obtained my highest wishes, he said, but was surprised to find that I grasped a shadow. He felt a disappointment which astonished himself, that the great object for which he had labored so hard and sacrificed so much, and which had caused him even to neglect the interest which he had in eternity, should now seem as vain and unsatisfying as if he had been toiling to pursue a shadow. Happy is the youth who will not wait for experience to convince him that this is a truth, and will believe what the word of God asserts to be the end of all such hopes and efforts, who will trust the declarations of those men who have tried for themselves, and, like Martin, have been obliged, in the midst of their triumph, honestly to confess that they were disappointed of the happiness which they calculated on as sure. Martin had been so diligent in order to gain this supposed reward that his fellow-students called him the man who had not lost an hour, he found too late that he had forever lost many hours of opportunity of acquiring the knowledge of divine truth, and of his own duty, and many hours of happiness, such as all the honors and even all the pleasures of learning can never confer, or compensate a man for its loss. Martin spent the vacation of the next summer at college, and had the opportunity of being much alone, and his attention not being absorbed by his studies as formerly, he was able to give a more serious and deep attention to the condition of his soul. He devoted much time to meditation upon his past life, the wandering of his affection from God, and the necessity of some great change in his heart, to bring him to make that willing devotion of himself to his service, which he saw was reasonably required of him, and which he felt ought to be his highest happiness. God, he observes, was pleased to bless the solitude and retirement I enjoyed this summer, to my improvement, and not until then had I ever experienced any real pleasure in religion. I was more convinced of sin than ever, more earnest in fleeing to Jesus for refuge, and more desirous of the renewal of my nature. 
His friendship with the Rev. Mr. Simeon of Cambridge, and several pious young men, was a great advantage in winning his affections to religion, and giving him a correct view of the Christian character. He had determined to apply himself to the study of law, chiefly, as he confessed, because he could not consent to be poor for Christ's sake. But now he felt willing to cut off all prospect of temporal distinction, and resolved to prepare for the ministry. The influence of the Spirit seemed to attend the use of the means of spiritual knowledge, so that he could write to a friend in September, 1801, Blessed be God, I have now experienced that Christ is the power of God, and the wisdom of God. What a blessing is the gospel! No heart can conceive its excellency, but that which has been renewed by divine grace. About the same time he wrote thus to his sister, when we consider the misery and darkness of the unregenerate world, oh, with how much reason should we burst out into thanksgiving to God, who has called us in his mercy through Christ Jesus! Who that reflects upon the rock from which he was hewn, but must rejoice to give himself entirely and without reserve to God, to be sanctified by his Spirit? The soul that has truly experienced the love of God will not stay meanly inquiring how much he shall do, and thus limit his service, but will be earnestly seeking, more and more, to know the will of our Heavenly Father, that he may be enabled to do it. Oh, may we be both thus minded! May we experience Christ to be our all in all, not only as our Redeemer, but as the fountain of grace! Those passages of the word of God which you have quoted on this head are indeed awakening. May they teach us to breathe after holiness, to be more and more dead to the world, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus. We are lights in the world. How needful, then, that our tempers and lives should manifest our high and heavenly calling. Let us, as we do, provoke one another to good works, not doubting but that God will bless our feeble endeavors to his glory. Happening to call at a house where a gentleman, with whom he had a slight acquaintance, was lying ill, he found his wife in great agony on account of the unprepared state of her husband to enter eternity, and in expectation of being left with her family entirely destitute of maintenance, if he should die. He found it vain to direct her thoughts to God, whom they both had probably neglected to serve in their prosperity, and he went to visit her daughters, who had removed to another house that their appearance of grief might not disturb the dying man. Upon entering the room he found a member of college diverting their thoughts by reading a play to them. He was so astonished and indignant at the sight that he rebuked the young man in such a manner that he thought it would produce a quarrel between them. But he was joyfully surprised afterwards when he came to thank him for the reproof and acknowledge that it had made a serious impression on his mind, which proved to be permanent and Mr. Martin was afterwards associated with him as a missionary in India. In March 1802, Mr. Martin was successful in being elected to a fellowship in the college, a privilege granted to a select number of the best scholars who are, on certain conditions, supported by the funds of the college, and have the privilege of residing there. Soon afterwards he obtained the first prize for having produced the best Latin composition. Thus he was rising rapidly to distinction, and his prospects of success in life were brilliant. His talents and acquirements would no doubt have easily procured him honorable and profitable employment. His strong natural passion of ambition had everything that is tempting in success to allure him in its path. The prospect of a distinguished career was opening most favorably before him. The sincerity of his resolution to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness was put to the strongest trial. Yet, through the divine grace, he was enabled to overlook all these temporal advantages, and made willing to consecrate his powers to the promotion of the glory of God. He had resolved to enter the ministry, but even in that profession, in England, there is a large field open for ambition— and the learning and talents of Martin might have gained him some of the highest stations in the church, where wealth, ease, and eminence could be enjoyed. 
but his great desire was to be employed in the manner in which he could do the most good to his fellow-men and promote the glory of god by extending the knowledge of jesus christ and his gospel he knew too that in the humblest station he would be most likely to increase in spiritual piety as he would be exposed to fewer of those temptations by which he had already been so much endangered he therefore determined to become a foreign missionary and offered himself as such to the english society now called the church missionary society for africa and the east it is too often the case that in perusing the life of an eminent disciple of christ the reader is led to suppose that the person who is spoken of in such terms of praise by the author was so excellent that he went beyond the holiness and duty that are required of men generally and that his devotedness must be a ground of worth in the sight of god this manner of writing should be carefully avoided as it encourages human presumption by leading men to trust much in the amount of good that they may do and flatters their pride by persuading them that great sacrifices in the cause of christianity entitle them to distinction not only in this world but in the eye of heaven alas it is because so few persons make any self-denial to promote the honour of the redeemer that such consequences result if every christian were to give up all his property and leave home and family for ever and go to dwell amongst the most degraded nations of the furthest lands it would not reach the amount of obligation they are under it would not equal by ten thousand degrees the favours of jesus christ to this world man can never by all his good deeds have a claim on the rewards of heaven even after a long life thus spent in wretchedness and banishment for the sake of doing good and converting souls it is an act of god's mere mercy and that for christ's sake that any one is accepted as a faithful servant and in this sense counted worthy of the kingdom of heaven but the usefulness of such writings consists in showing how much good an individual under the blessing of god may perform and thus encouraging other men to undertake great plans of usefulness by the proof that he condescends to make use of human creatures in accomplishing his great purposes of mercy to the world an instance of such devotedness to the service of god is often more powerful in inducing others to follow the example than even the fact which is so clear from scripture that god effects his purposes by human agency and that it is therefore men's duty to do their utmost at all hazards to promote the divine designs so it was in the case of martin himself whose thoughts were led to a missionary life by the accounts of the great success which had attended the labours of dr carey in india and of dr brainerd among the american indians and the object of preparing this life of henry martin is not to praise him for he only did his duty and even this as he acknowledged he did not do as no christian in this life does with that entire devotedness to christ and freedom from all sinful and selfish motives which the service of our divine master requires but our great design is to encourage our young readers to aim at doing much for christ and to show the power of divine grace which overcame the worldly ambition and love of wealth and comfort which were natural to martin and induced him to leave all prospect of happiness from these sources and to give himself up wholly to the employment of carrying the knowledge of the way of salvation to nations who were in all the darkness of idolatry nor are we supposed that it cost martin no struggle to give up all these prospects men are seldom so much sanctified as to make great sacrifices with entire cheerfulness he had still to strive with his pride his love of the world his indisposition to toil amongst a wretched and ignorant people but he found strength to sustain these trials by persevering earnest prayer by meditating more on the duty he owed his maker and the return which the atonement that christ had made for his sins called for from him thus through god's favour not through any ability of his own he became the useful man he afterwards was in india the nature of the temptations he underwent at times may be understood from his own candid statement of them to his pious sister 
I received your letter yesterday, and thank God for the concern you manifest for my spiritual welfare. Oh, that we may love each other more and more in the Lord. The passages you bring from the word of God were appropriate to my case, particularly those from the first epistle of St. Peter, and that to the Ephesians, though I do not seem to have given you a right view of my state. The dejection I sometimes labor under seems not to arise from doubts of my acceptance with God, though it tends to produce them, nor from desponding views of my own backwardness in the divine life, for I am more prone to self-dependence and conceit but from the prospect of the difficulties I have to encounter in the whole of my future life. The thought that I must be unceasingly employed in the same kind of work, amongst poor ignorant people, is what my proud spirit revolts at. To be obliged to submit to a thousand uncomfortable things that must happen to me, whether as a minister or a missionary, is what the flesh cannot endure. At these times, I feel neither love to God nor love to man, and in proportion as these graces of the spirit languish, my besetting sins, pride and discontent, and unwillingness for every duty make me miserable. You will best enter into my views by considering those texts which serve to recall me to a right aspect of things. I have not that coldness in prayer you would expect but generally find myself strengthened in faith and humility and love after it. But the impression is so short. I am at this time enabled to give myself, body, soul, and spirit to God, and perceive it to be my most reasonable service. How it may be when the trial comes, I know not. Yet I will trust and not be afraid. In order to do his will cheerfully, I want love for the souls of men, to suffer it, I want humility. Let these be the subjects of your supplications for me. I am thankful to God that you are so free from anxiety and care. We cannot but with praise acknowledge his goodness. What does it signify, whether we be rich or poor, if we are sons of God? How unconscious are they of their real greatness, and will be so until they find themselves in glory, when we contemplate our everlasting inheritance, it seems too good to be true. Yet it is no more than is due to the kindred of God manifest in the flesh. A journey I took last week into Norfolk seems to have contributed greatly to my health. The attention and admiration shown me are great and very dangerous. The praises of men do not now, indeed, flatter my vanity as they formerly did. I rather feel pain through anticipation of their consequences but they tend to produce, imperceptibly, a self-esteem and hardness of heart. How awful and awakening a consideration is it that God judgeth not as man judgeth! Our character before him is precisely as it was before or after any change of external circumstances. Men may applaud or revile, and make a man think differently of himself, but he judgeth of a man according to his secret walk. How difficult is the work of self-examination! Even to state to you imperfectly my own mind, I found to be no easy matter. Nay, St. Paul says, I judge not mine own self, for he that judgeth me is the Lord. That is, though he was not conscious of any allowed sin, yet he was not thereby justified, for God might perceive something of which he was not aware. How needful, then, the prayer of the psalmist! Search me, O God, and try my heart, and see if there be any evil way in me. May God be with you, and bless you, and uphold you with the right hand of his righteousness. And let us seek to love, for he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, for God is love. His diary furnishes a farther insight into his experience, and the resoluteness with which he opposed the wavering of his faith by continual application to the promises of God in Christ. Since I have endeavored to divest myself of every consideration independent of religion, I see the difficulty of maintaining a liveliness and devotion for any considerable time together. Nevertheless, as I shall have to pass the greater part of my future life, after leaving England, with no other source of happiness than reading, meditation, and prayer, 
I think it right to be gradually mortifying myself to every species of worldly pleasure. In all my past life I have fixed on some desirable ends at different distances, the attainment of which was to furnish me with happiness. But now, in seasons of unbelief, nothing seems to lie before me but one vast, uninteresting wilderness, and heaven appearing but dimly at the end. Oh, how does this show the necessity of living by faith! What a shame that I cannot make the doing of God's will my ever delightful object, and the prize of my high calling, the mark after which I press! I was under disquiet at the prospect of my future work, encompassed, as it appeared, with difficulties, but I trusted I was under the guidance of infinite wisdom, and on that I could rest. Mr. Johnson, who had returned from a mission, observed that the crosses to be endured were far greater than could be conceived, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto me, so that I might finish my course with joy. Had some disheartening thoughts at night, at the prospect of being stripped of every earthly comfort, but who is it that maketh my comforts to be a source of enjoyment? Cannot the same hand make cold, and hunger, and nakedness, and peril, to be a train of ministering angels, conducting me to glory? O oh, my soul, compare thyself with St. Paul, and with the example and precepts of the Lord Jesus Christ. Was it not his meat and drink to do the will of his heavenly Father? What is the state of my own soul before God? I believe that it is right in principle— I desire no other portion but God, but I pass so many hours as if there were no God at all. I live far below the hope, comfort, and holiness of the gospel, but be not slothful, O my soul. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of thy faith. For whom was grace intended, if not for me? Are not the promises made to me? Is not my Maker in earnest, when he declareth that he willeth my sanctification, and hath laid help on one that is mighty? I will therefore have no confidence in the flesh, but will rejoice in the Lord, and the joy of the Lord shall be my strength. May I receive from above a pure, a humble, a benevolent, a heavenly mind. Learnt by heart some of the first three chapters of Revelations, this is to me the most searching and alarming part of the Bible. Yet, not with humble hope, I trusted that the censures of my Lord did not belong to me, except that those words, Revelations chapter 2, verse 3, For my name's sake thou hast laboured and hast not fainted, were far too high a testimony for me to think of appropriating to myself. Nevertheless, I besought the Lord that whatever I had been, I might now be perfect and complete in all the will of God. Men frequently admire me, and I am pleased, but I abhor the pleasure I feel. Oh, did they but know that my root is rottenness! Heard Professor Farish preach at Trinity Church on Luke chapter 7, verses 4 and 5, and was deeply impressed with the reasonableness and necessity of the fear of God felt it to be a light matter to be judged of man's judgment. Why have I not awful apprehensions of the glorious being at all times? The particular promise, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, dwelt a long time in my mind, and diffused an affectionate reverence of God. I see a great work before me now, namely, the subduing and mortifying of my perverted will. What am I that I should dare to do my own will, even if I were not a sinner? But now how plain, how reasonable to have the love of Christ constraining me to be his faithful, willing servant, cheerfully taking up the cross he shall appoint me. Read some of Amos. The reading of the prophets is to me one of the most delightful employments. One cannot but be charmed with the beauty of the imagery while they never fail to inspire me with awful thoughts of God and of his hatred of sin. The reading of Baxter's Saint's Rest determined me to live more in heavenly meditation. Walked by moonlight, and found it a sweet relief to my mind to think of God and consider my ways before him. I was strongly impressed with the vanity of the world, 
and could not help wondering at the imperceptible operation of grace which had enabled me to resign the expectation of happiness from it how frequently has my heart been refreshed by the descriptions in the scriptures of the future glory of the church and the happiness of man hereafter i felt the force of baxter's observation that if an angel had appointed to meet me i should be full of awe how much more when i am about to meet god ah what a heart is mine the indistinctness of my view of its desperate wickedness is terrible to me that is when i am capable of feeling any terror but now my soul rise from earth and hell shall satan lead me captive at his will when christ ever liveth to make intercession for the vilest worm o thou whose i am by creation preservation redemption no longer my own but his who lived and died and rose again once more would i resign this body and soul mean and worthless as they are to the blessed disposal of thy holy will may i have a heart to love god and his people the flesh being crucified may grace abound where sin has abounded much may i cheerfully and joyfully resign my ease and life in the service of jesus to whom i owe so much may it be sweet to me to proclaim to sinners like myself the blessed efficacy of my saviour's blood may he make me faithful unto death the greatest enemy i dread is the pride of my own heart through pride reigning i should forget to know a broken spirit then would come on unbelief weakness apostasy let then he wrote to a friend no obstacle intervene to prevent the increase of my self-knowledge in which i am lamentably deficient let us both bend our minds to the discipline necessary to obtain it and communicate our discoveries for a mutual benefit how strongly is the importance of self-knowledge and the difficulty of obtaining it marked by these words keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And to those who cannot keep their hearts for want of knowing anything about them, very compassionate are the words of our Lord, Because thou knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayst be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayst be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You put me in mind, in your last letter, of former days. What fruit had we then in those things, whereof we are now ashamed? But those days have passed away for ever, and when glory shall open upon our view, neither sorrow nor sin shall again interrupt our joys for ever. I will echo your words, and say, What manner of love is this? that we should be called the sons of God. We may look upon one another, and remember our former selves, and say, What hath God wrought? Not by works of righteousness, which thou hast done, but according to his mercy he saved thee. Now then, my dear brother, let all the rest of our life be cheerfully devoted to God. We are no longer our own, but are bought with a price. With what a price! Let us adore him also that we are called in our youth, that while our hearts are susceptible of warm emotions, they are taught the glow of divine affections. Let us glorify him on the earth, if many years are assigned us, and finish the work which he hath given us to do. And may we come to our graves in a full age, as a shock of corn cometh in his season. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of the Life of Rev. Henry Martin by John Hall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Martin was ordained to the ministry on the twenty second of October, eighteen o three. He complained to a friend that this occasion, so solemn in itself, through want of retirement, was not so to me. He passed the time which, by the rules of the English Episcopal Church, is required before ministers can be admitted to the full exercise of the sacred office, as assistant to his friend, the Rev. Mr. Simeon, in his church at Cambridge, 
and as pastor in a small village at a short distance from the town. In this capacity he labored constantly in preaching and in making religious visits to the houses of the poor and to hospitals. After speaking of his preparations for the pulpit, he says, Another part of my state administrations is to visit one part of Mr. Simeon's people every week. Unless the mind be in a spiritual and heavenly frame, it is difficult to go through this service with any degree of satisfaction. However, though I have often gone to them cramped with sinful fear, I have been enabled to go through with ease and comfort, thanks be to God. I have been generally in great depression of spirits ever since my ordination, for having at that time not a single sermon, my hands and head have been constantly employed in that business, while my heart has not had its due share of exercise. I am now recovering from my cowardly despondency on that head, but lately I have been in heaviness again, through the prevalence of self-will and the prospect of incessant self-denial. God help me to endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, to fight the good fight of faith, and to be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. My chief comfort is to meditate on the world to come, though it is a happiness which I can seldom steadily enjoy, the train of one's thoughts is so influenced and directed by the empty concerns of human life. Another evil with me is great childish levity and want of serious conviction of the awful work of the ministry. In the pulpit I have hitherto been thinking only of the sermon before me, unconscious of the presence of God or the people. Deliver me from blood-guiltiness, O God. During this interval the estate which his sister and himself inherited from their father was lost, and instead of being able to go out as a missionary at his own expense, as appears to have been his original design, he now sought an appointment as a chaplain of the East India Company to be employed at some of their stations, which he thought would give him great advantages in preaching to the heathen. We copy here another of his letters. I am glad to hear that the gospel spreads among you for the sake of my poor fellow sinners. Oh, that I had the glory of Christ more at heart! Most of us have far too little earnestness, and I for one. Walls Lane is in my parish here. Its well-known character will give you to understand that I have abundant room for the exercise of zeal. I have as yet visited only the two almshouses and the poorhouse, in which I meet the people once a week, and two or three other houses. To cleanse these stables of Augeas, I may well be taught a useful lesson from the fabled hero, not to attempt the work in my own strength, but to turn the river of grace into it. In my country parish, religion is at a low ebb. The school, however, is re-established, and the benefit of it will, I trust, be of eternal consequence. With respect to my own heart, my dear friend, what shall I say? I have been visited, of late, with some very severe trials of which the loss of the fortunes of myself and two sisters is the least. As often as the pride and arrogance of my heart are brought down into the dust, and I am able to walk softly before the Lord, I am peaceful and happy enough. My present desire is to walk alone with God. I have lived too much in public, going to God in prayer as if I were coming out of a crowd and about to be tossed into it again. But to walk with God is surely to be with Him always, to preach as one delivering the message in His presence, to plead with souls as in the stead of the invisible God near us. Ah, oh, my brother, we die alone. If we had not lived in solitary communion with God, we shall start at finding ourselves, in the solemn silence of death, about to launch forward where no friends, no ordinances can accompany us. We cannot help observing how the impressive thought contained in the last sentences was strikingly and literally exemplified in the circumstances of his own decease. He shortly wrote again, I am about to alter my plan of preaching to my country congregation. They have been hearing from me the gospel, for which they are by no means prepared, for I have discovered, to my surprise and grief, that they do not know the difference between sin and duty. 
it is now my design to explain to them the commandments sermon on the mount etc through the tender mercy of god i begin to feel a little more zeal and earnestness than formerly oh my brother how great the honour that in our office at least we are like to christ that in this respect as he was so are we in this world may love carry forward our feet in swift obedience and may we continue in our work with all firmness and patience and tenderness for the souls of men martin spent much of his time in devotion and in reading the scriptures he committed large portions to memory that he might always have a subject for meditation and whenever he became so interested in any other book as to have reason to fear that it was more pleasing to him than the bible he would at once lay it aside until by returning to the sacred volume his mind was restored to feel the value and interest of its truths above all others he was in the habit of setting apart whole days for secret religious services examining his heart searching the scriptures and imploring the mercy and direction of god and that he might do this with the least interruption he was accustomed to abstain from his usual food at such seasons as devout men from very ancient times have observed fasts he thus speaks in his diary of the reasons and effects of these occasions i felt the need of setting apart a day for the restoration of my soul by solemn prayer my views of eternity are becoming dim and transient i could live for ever in prayer if i could always speak to god i sought to pause and to consider what i wanted and to look up with fear and faith and i found the benefit for my soul was soon composed to that devout sobriety which i knew by its sweetness to be its proper frame i was engaged in prayer in the manner i like deep seriousness and at the end of it i felt great fear of forgetting the presence of god and of leaving him as soon as i should leave the posture of devotion i was led through the mists of unbelief and spake to god as one that was true and rejoiced exceedingly that he was holy and faithful i endeavoured to consider myself as being alone on the earth with him and that greatly promoted my approach to his presence my prayer for a meek and holy sobriety was granted oh how sweet the dawn of heaven as there was every prospect of succeeding in the application he had made for an indian chaplaincy he began to prepare for his departure by taking leave of his friends in cornwall this was of course a severe trial he was to bid farewell to country and friends to sisters and a lady to whom he was still more tenderly attached with the prospect of never again seeing them in this world to a person of his amiable and domestic disposition such a separation was full of distress besides he was going to reside in another and far distant continent in a climate so hot that it always weakens and is often fatal to the constitutions of natives of cooler countries the people with whom he expected to live were uneducated poor vicious and idolatrous having never been instructed in christianity his task would be to overcome if possible the prejudices in favour of their own superstitions which they and their ancestors had cherished for centuries and to persuade them to adopt a religion which would oblige them to give up their dearest sinful enjoyments ignorant of each other's language he would be obliged to study theirs although one little known to europeans and extremely difficult to be acquired these discouragements are mentioned not to exalt the praises of martin for had he been a perfect man they would have appeared too insignificant to affect him at all but to show that god gives strength to those who serve him and depend upon him proportionate to their trials and necessities that his grace can enable a man to do actions of benevolence which no other influence could and that the sacrifices which martin made are a proof of the reality of religion as well as of the sincerity of his own professions let the person who is now reading this page stop here and ask whether he would be willing to leave his parents friends and home to-morrow and go to live amongst a population of half-savage people sixteen thousand miles from his home and spend the whole of his life in teaching them to read and persuading them to believe the gospel 
to be all this time subject to abuse and ridicule from most of these people, to be exposed to weak health and early death, and to do all this merely and solely because, if a single one is converted, it would promote the glory of God by bringing one more soul to acknowledge him and make that soul happy for ever. Let the reader who has now his eye upon these words seriously ask what would induce him or her to do this, and then think, if you are not willing at once to act thus, what is it that is wanting in you? You will find that religion is indeed a reality, that the Bible is indeed true, which declares that God will surely make willing and able all who put their trust in him to perform whatever his providence calls them to do. If you profess to be a follower of Christ, and to seek the advancement of his kingdom, are you doing all you can for this object, or are you waiting for the judgment, supposing that Christ will acknowledge a professed but unprofitable servant? End of chapter 3「Four of the Life of Rev. Henry Martin by John Hall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Cornwall, Mr. Martin returned to Cambridge, where he continued to assist Mr. Simeon in his church. Although distressed with the consciousness of his sinfulness and unworthiness to be a minister of Christ, he had comforts also, which assured him that he had an interest in his divine Redeemer, so that he could confidently say, I wish for no service but the service of God, to labor for souls on earth, and to do his will in heaven. And at another time, oh, hasten the day when I shall come to thee, when I shall no more be vexed and astonished and pained at the universal wretchedness of this lost earth. But here would I abide my time, and spend and be spent for the salvation of any poor soul, lie down at the feet of sinners, and beseech them not to plunge into an eternity of torment. It will be instructive to copy here some pages from his letters and diary, in which he wrote down the state of his feelings at this period. We should consider it as a sign for good, my dearest S., when the Lord reveals to us the almost desperate corruption of our hearts. For if he causes us to groan under it as an insupportable burden, he will, we may hope, in his own time, give us deliverance. The pride which I see dwelling in my own heart, producing there the most obstinate hardness, I can truly say my soul abhors. I see it to be unreasonable, I feel it to be tormenting. When I sometimes offer up supplications, with strong crying to God, to bring down my spirit into the dust, I endeavor calmly to contemplate the infinite majesty of the Most High God, and my own meanness and wickedness, or else I quietly tell the Lord, who knows my heart, that I would give him all the glory of everything, if I could. But the most effectual way I have ever found is to lead away my thoughts from myself and my own concerns, by praying for all my friends, for the church, the world, the nation and especially by beseeching that God would glorify his own great name by converting all nations to the obedience of faith, also by praying that he would put more abundant honor on those Christians whom he seems to have honored especially, and whom we see to be manifestly our superiors. This is at least a positive act of humility, and it is certain that not only will a good principle produce a good act, but the act will increase the principle. But, even after doing all this, there will often arise a certain self-complacency which has need to be checked, and in conversation with Christian friends we should be careful, I think, how self is introduced. Unless we think that good will be done, self should be kept in the background and mortified. We are bound to be servants of all, ministering to their pleasure as far as will be to their profit, we are to look not at our own things, but at the things of others. Be assured, my dear S., that night and day, making mention of you in my prayers, I desire of God to give you to see the depth of pride and iniquity in your heart, yet not to be discouraged at the sight of it, 
that you may perceive yourself deserving to be cast out with abhorrence from God's presence, and then may walk in continual poverty of spirit and the simplicity of a little child. Pray, too, that I may know something of humility. Blessed grace! How it smooths the furrows of care and gilds the dark paths of life! It will make us kind, tender-hearted, affable, and enable us to do more for God and the gospel than the most fervent zeal without it. September 30th, 1804 My mind this morning easily ascended to God in peaceful solemnity. I succeeded in finding access to God and being alone with Him. Could I but enjoy this life of faith more steadily, how much should I grow in grace and be renewed in the spirit of my mind? At such seasons of fellowship with the Father and His Son Jesus Christ, when the world and self and eternity are nearly in their right places, not only are my views of duty clear and comprehensive, but the proper motives have a more constraining influence. October 28th. This has been in general a happy day. In the morning, through grace, I was enabled by prayer to maintain a calm recollection of myself, and what was better, of the presence of my dear Redeemer. From the church I walked to our garden, where I was above an hour, I trust, with Christ, speaking to him chiefly of my future life in his service. I determined on entire devotedness, though with trembling, for the flesh dreads crucifixion. But should I fear pain when Christ was so agonized for me? No, come what will, I am determined through God to be a fellow worker with Christ. I recollected with comfort that I was speaking to the great Creator who can make such a poor weak worm as myself more than a conqueror. At church I found by the attention of the people that the fervor of my spirit yesterday had been conveyed into my sermon. I came to my room, rejoicing to be alone again, and to hold communion with God. December 9th. This has been in general a sweet and blessed day, a foretaste of my eternal Sabbath. Preached on the third commandment, in the afternoon on the tenth. Rode back to Cambridge, feeling quite willing to go anywhere or to suffer anything for God. Preached in Trinity Church, on Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? It was pleasant to me to think of being alone again with God. January 1, 1805 Hitherto hath the Lord helped me. It is now about five years since God stopped me in the career of worldliness and turned me from the paths of sin. Three years and a half since I turned to the Lord with all my heart, and a little more than two years since he enabled me to devote myself to his service as a missionary. My progress of late has become slower than it had been, yet I can truly say that in the course of this time every successive year every successive week has been happier than the former. From many dangerous snares hath the Lord preserved me, in spite of all my inward rebellion. He hath carried on his work in my heart, and in spite of all my unbelieving fears, he hath given me a hope full of immortality. He hath set my foot on a rock, and established my goings, and hath put a new song in my mouth, even praises to my God." It is the beginning of a critical year to me, yet I feel little apprehension. The same grace and long-suffering, the same wisdom and power that have brought me so far, will bring me on, though it be through fire and water, to a goodly heritage. I see no business in life but the work of Christ, neither do I desire any employment to all eternity but His service. I am a sinner saved by grace. Every day's experience convinces me of this truth. My daily sins and constant corruption leave me no hope, but that which is founded on God's mercy in Christ. His Spirit, I trust, is imparted, and is renewing my nature, as I desire much, though I have attained but little. Now to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, would I solemnly renew my self-dedication, to be His servant 
forever. I could not help reflecting on the almost supernatural fervor and deep devotion which came upon me, whilst I declared that I had rightfully no other business each day but to do God's work as a servant, constantly regarding his pleasure. My thoughts were full of what God would do for his own glory in the conversion of multitudes to himself in the latter day. I did not wish to think about myself in any respect, but found it a precious privilege to stand by, a silent admirer of God's doings. In March 1805 he completed the time required before he could be sent out as a minister, and there was nothing more to detain him from proceeding on his mission. I rejoice to say, he wrote at this time to his sister, that I never had so clear a conviction of my call as at present, as far as it respects the inward impression. Never did I see so much the exceeding excellency and glory and sweetness of the work, nor had so much of the favorable testimony of my own conscience, nor perceived so plainly the smile of God. I am constrained to say, what am I, or what is my father's house, that I should be made willing? What am I, that I should be so happy, so honored? In his journal, likewise, he expresses himself to the same effect. I felt more persuaded of my call than ever. There was scarcely the shadow of a doubt left. Rejoice, O my soul, thou shalt be the servant of God in this life, and in the next, for all the boundless ages of eternity." In April he went to London, where he remained two months, principally employed in learning Hindustani, the language of a large part of India, made up of the Sanskrit, Persian, and Arabic. The entries of his diary during this interval will best exhibit the state of his heart, in anticipation of his employment. April 15th. Oh, may God confirm my feeble resolutions! What have I to do but to labor and pray and fast and watch? for the salvation of my own soul and those of the heathen world. Ten thousand times more than ever do I feel devoted to that precious work. Oh, gladly shall this base blood be shed, every drop of it, if India can be benefited in one of her children, if but one of those children of God Almighty might be brought home to his duty. April 16th. How careful should I, and all be in our ministry, not to break the bruised reed. Alas, do I think that a schoolboy, a raw academic, should be likely to lead the hearts of men? What a knowledge of men, and acquaintance with the scriptures, what communion with God and study of my own heart, ought to prepare me for the awful work of a messenger from God on the business of the soul? April 22nd. I do not wish for any heaven upon earth besides that of preaching the precious gospel of Jesus Christ to immortal souls. May these weak desires increase and strengthen with every difficulty. April 27th. My constant unprofitableness seemed to bar my approach to God. But I considered that for all that was past the blood of Christ would atone, and that for the future... God would that moment give me grace to perform my duty. May ninth, O oh my soul, when wilt thou live consistently? When shall I walk steadily with God? When shall I hold heaven constantly in view? How time glides away! How is death approaching? How soon must I give up my account? How are souls perishing? How does their blood call out to us to labor and watch and pray for them that remain? June 1. Memory has been at work to unnerve my soul, but reason and honor and love to Christ and souls shall prevail. Amen. God help me. June 2. My dear Redeemer is a fountain of life to my soul. With resignation and peace can I look forward to a life of labor and entire seclusion from earthly comforts, while Jesus thus stands near me, changing me into his own image. June 6th. God's interference in supporting me continually appears to me like a miracle. June 7th. I have not felt such heart-rending pain since I parted with L. in Cornwall, the lady to whom he was attached. But the Lord brought me to consider the folly and wickedness of all this. 
I could not help saying, Go, Hindus, go on in your misery. Let Satan still reign over you. For he that was appointed to labor among you is consulting his ease. No, thought I, earth and hell shall never keep me back from my work. I am cast down, but not destroyed. I began to consider why I was so uneasy. Cast thy care upon him, for he careth for you. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. These promises were sweetly fulfilled before long to me. July 4th. Mr. Cecil showed me a letter in Swartz's own handwriting. Its contents were of a very experimental nature, applicable to my case. The life of faith in Jesus is what I want. My soul might almost burst with astonishment at its own wickedness, but at the same time, trusting to mercy, rise and go, and try to make men happy. The Lord go with me. Let my right hand forget her cunning, if I remember not Jerusalem above my chief joy. On the 8th of July, 1805, Mr. Martin proceeded to Portsmouth, from which place he was to sail in a ship of the East India Company to Calcutta, there to act as chaplain of the company. His feelings were so painful that he fainted and fell into a fit at a tavern on the road. He was met by a number of friends at Portsmouth, who had come to bid him a final farewell for this life, and he received there a silver compass, sent by his congregation as a token of remembrance, which he acknowledged in the following letter. Portsmouth, July 11, 1805 My dearest brethren, I write in great haste to thank you most affectionately for the token of your love, which our dear brother and minister has given me from you. Oh, may my God richly recompense you for your great affection. May he reward your prayers for me by pouring tenfold blessings into your own bosoms. May he bless you with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. At the command of God, as I believe, I shall, in a few hours, embark for those regions where your little present may be of use to me in guiding my way through the trackless desert. I pray that the word of God, which is your compass, may, through the Spirit, direct your path through the wilderness of this world, and bring you in safety to the better country above. I beg your prayers, and assure you of mine. Remember me sometimes at your social meetings, and particularly at that which you hold on the Sabbath morning. Pray not only for my sinful soul, that I may be kept faithful unto death, but especially for the souls of the poor heathen. Whether I live or die, let Christ be magnified in the ingathering of multitudes to himself. I have many trials awaiting me, and so have you. But that covenant of grace in which we are interested provides for the weakest and secures our everlasting welfare. Farewell, dear brethren. May God long continue to you the invaluable labors of your beloved minister, and may you, with the blessing of his ministry, grow day by day in all spirituality and humility of mind, till God in his mercy shall call you, each in his own time, to the eternal enjoyment of his glory. On the 17th July the ship sailed, in company with a fleet, taking an army to India. It was a very painful moment, he wrote to one of his friends, when I awoke on the morning after you left us, and found the fleet actually sailing down the channel. Though it was what I had anxiously been looking forward to so long, yet the consideration of being parted for ever from my friends almost overcame me. My feelings were those of a man who should suddenly be told that every friend he had in the world was dead. It was only by prayer for them that I could be comforted, and this was indeed a refreshment to my soul, because by meeting them at the throne of grace I seemed to be again in their society. The vessel, however, unexpectedly stopped in two days at Falmouth, an English port, inside of Cornwall. It was a renewal of the pain of separation to be thus brought again for a short time upon the shores which he had supposed he had left for ever. He appears from his journal to have suffered great struggles with his earthly affections, but he was supported by him who never leaves his disciples to contend alone with the trials of their faith. July 29th. I was much engaged at intervals in learning the hymn, The God of Abraham Praise 
as often as I could use the language of it with any truth, my heart was a little at ease. The God of Abraham prays, at whose supreme command, from earth I rise and seek the joys at his right hand. I all on earth forsake, its wisdom, fame, and power, and him my only portion make, my shield and tower. There was something peculiarly solemn and affecting to me in this hymn, and particularly at this time. The truth of the sentiments I knew well enough, but alas, I felt that the state of mind expressed in it was above mine at the time, and I felt loath to forsake all on earth. I went on board in extreme anguish, and found an opportunity in the sloop by which I passed to the ship to cry with brokenness of spirit to the Lord. The words, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God, were brought to mind with such force that I burst into a flood of tears, and felt much relieved in my soul by the thought that God was thus compassionate, and the blessed Lord Jesus a merciful and compassionate high priest, who condescended to sympathize with me. In the afternoon it pleased God to give me a holy and blessed season in prayer, in which my soul recovered much of its wonted peace. Orders for the sailing of the fleet, with which his ship was connected, were given on the 10th of August, whilst Martin was twenty miles in the country. An express was sent after him, but had not an accident happened to the ship in clearing from the harbour, he would have been too late. On the 14th the fleet anchored again for two weeks at Cork in Ireland. He had suffered much from despondence and weakness of health, and speaks in his journal of the trials of his lot as being far greater than he had expected. But he was blessed also with spiritual consolation, in proportion as he placed his confidence on him who called him to the service. On one occasion, he says, After a long and blessed season in prayer, I felt the spirit of adoption drawing me very near to God, and giving me the full assurance of his love. My fervent prayer was that I might be more deeply and habitually convinced of his unchanging, everlasting love, and that my whole soul might be altogether in Christ. I scarcely knew how to express the desires of my heart. I wanted to be all in Christ, and to have Christ for my all in all, to be encircled in his everlasting arms, and to be swallowed up altogether in his fullness. I wished for no created good nor for men to know my experience, but to be one with thee, and live for thee, O God, my Saviour and Lord. O oh, may it be my constant care to live free from the spirit of bondage, at all times having access to the Father. This, I feel, should be the state of the Christian, perfect reconciliation with God, and a perfect appropriation of him in all his endearing attributes, according to all that he has promised. It is this that shall bear me safely through the storm. And some weeks afterwards, September 23rd, we are just to the south of all Europe, and I bid adieu to it forever, without a wish of ever revisiting it, and still less with any desire of taking up my rest in the strange land to which I am going. Ah, no, farewell, perishing world! To me to live shall be Christ." I have nothing to do here but to labor as a stranger, and by secret prayer and outward exertion do as much as possible for the Church of Christ and my own soul, till my eyes close in death, and my soul wings its way to a brighter world. Strengthen me, O God, my Saviour, that whether living or dying I may be thine. He preached once every Sunday on board the ship, the captain not permitting it more frequently. To make up for this loss, he almost daily read religious books, with remarks of his own, to as many as would assemble to hear him, but he could gain the serious attention of very few. September 10th. Endeavored to consider what should be my study and preparation for the mission, but could devise no particular plan, but to search the scriptures, what are God's promises respecting the spread of the gospel, and of the means by which it shall be accomplished. Long seasons of prayer in behalf of the heathen, I am sure, are necessary. Isaiah 7. I began Isaiah, and learnt by heart the promises scattered through the first twelve chapters, 
hoping it may prove profitable matter for meditation as well as prayer. Read the pilgrim's progress below amidst the greatest noise and interruption. Notwithstanding the clamour, I felt as if I could preach to a million of noisy persons with unconquerable boldness. We have been becalmed the whole day. I fear my soul has been much in the same state, but I would not that it should be so any longer. September 15th, Sunday. He that testifieth these things saith, Behold, I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Happy John, though shut out from society and the ordinances of grace, happy wast thou in thy solitude, when by it thou wast induced thus gladly to welcome the Lord's words, and to repeat them with a prayer. Read and preached on Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. In the latter part, when I was led to speak, without preparation, on the all-sufficiency of Christ to save sinners, who come to him with all their sins without delay, I was enabled by divine aid to speak with freedom and energy. My soul was refreshed, and I retired, seeing reason to be thankful. The weather was fair and calm, inviting the mind to tranquillity and praise. The ship just moved upon the face of the troubled ocean. I went below in hopes of reading Baxter's call to the unconverted, but there was no getting down as they were taking out water, so I sat with the seamen on the gun-deck. As I walked in the evening at sunset, I thought with pleasure, but a few more suns, and I shall be where my sun shall no more go down. September 16th. Two things were much in my mind this morning in prayer. The necessity of entering more deeply into my own heart, and laboring after humiliation, and for that reason setting apart times for fasting, as also to devote times for solemn prayer for fitness in the ministry, especially love for souls, and for the effusion of the Spirit on heathen lands, according to God's command. The study of the Hindustani language was part of his employment during the voyage. He also instructed some of the young soldiers in mathematics, and read French with a passenger. As they entered the warm latitudes, he found his strength diminishing very fast, and he began to fear he could never be useful as a preacher in India. "'But what means this anxiety?' he said. "'Is it not of God that I am led into outward difficulties, that my faith may be tried?' Suppose, addressing himself, you are obliged to return, or that you never see India, but wither and die here. What is that to you? Do the will of God where you can, and leave the rest to him. About this time he was much impressed with this sentence in Milner's church history. To believe, to suffer, and to love was the primitive taste and he received great encouragement by being thus led to contemplate the examples of those who had been more bold in serving Christ. End of chapter 4《Chapter 5 of the Life of Rev. Henry Martin by John Hall》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The fleet touched at several ports on their way, some portions of his journal at St. Salvador in South America will give an interesting variety to our pages. I continued my walk in quest of a wood, or some trees where I might sit down, but all was appropriated. No tree was to be approached except through an enclosure. At last I came to a magnificent porch before a garden gate, which was open. I walked in, but finding the vista led straight to the house, I turned to the right, and found myself in a grove of coconut trees, orange trees, and several strange fruit trees. Under them was nothing but rose trees, but no verdure on the ground. Oranges were strewed like apples in an orchard. Perceiving that I was observed by the slaves, I came up to the house, and was directed by them to an old man sitting under a tree, apparently insensible from illness. I spoke to him in French and in English, but he took no notice. Presently a young man and a young lady appeared, to whom I spoke in French, and was very politely desired to sit down at a little table, which was standing under a large space before the house like a veranda. They then brought me oranges and a small red acid fruit, the name of which I asked, but cannot recollect. 
The young man sat opposite, conversing about Cambridge. He had been educated in a Portuguese university. Almost immediately on finding I was of Cambridge, he invited me to come when I liked to his house. A slave, after bringing the fruit, was sent to gather three roses for me. The master then walked with me round the garden, and showed me, among the rest, the coffee plant. When I left him, he repeated his invitation. His name was Antonio Corre. November 14th. Signor Antonio received me with the same cordiality. He begged me to dine with him. In the cool of the evening we walked out to see his plantation. Here everything possessed the charm of novelty. The grounds included two hills and a valley between them. The hills were covered with coconut trees, bananas, mangoes, orange and lemon trees, olives, coffee, chocolate and cotton plants, etc. In the valley was a large plantation of a shrub or tree, bearing a cluster of small berries, which he desired me to taste. I did, and found it was pepper. It had lately been introduced from Batavia, and answered very well. It grows on a stem about the thickness of a finger, to the height of about seven feet, and is supported by a stick, which at that height has another across it for the branches to spread upon. Slaves were walking about the grounds, watering the trees and turning up the earth. The soil appeared very dry and loose. At night I returned to the ship in one of the country boats, which are canoes made of a tree hollowed out, and paddled by three men. November 18th. Went ashore at six o'clock, and found that Signor Antonio had been waiting for me two hours. It being too late to go into the country, I stayed at his house till dinner. He kept me too much in his company, but I found intervals for retirement. In a cool and shady part of the garden, near some water, I sat and sang, O'er the gloomy hills of darkness. I could read and pray aloud, as there was no fear of anyone understanding me. A slave in my bedroom washed my feet. I was struck with the degree of abasement expressed in the act, and as he held the foot in the towel, with his head bowed down towards it, I remembered the condescension of the blessed Lord. May I have grace to follow such humility. November 19th. Early after breakfast, went in a palanquin to Señor Dominigos, and from thence with him two or three miles into the country. At intervals I got out and walked. I was gratified with the sight of what I wanted to see, namely, some part of the country in its original state, covered with wood. It was hilly, but not mountainous. The luxuriance was so rank that the whole space, even to the tops of the trees, was filled with long, stringy shrubs and weeds, so as to make them impervious and opaque. The road was made by cutting away the earth on the side of the hill, so that there were woods above and below us. The object of our walk was to see a pepper plantation, made in a valley on a perfect level. The symmetry of the trees was what charmed my Portuguese friend, but to me, who was seeking the wild features of America, it was just what I did not want. The person who showed us the grounds was one that had been a major in the Portuguese army, and had retired on a pension. The border consisted of pine apples, planted between each tree. The interior was set with lemon trees, here and there between the pepper plants. We were shown the root of the mandioc, called by us tapioca. It was like a large horseradish. The mill for grinding it was extremely simple. A horizontal wheel, turned by horses, put in motion by a vertical one, on the circumference of which was a thin brazen plate, furnished on the inside like a nutmeg grater. A slave held the root to the wheel, which grated it away, and threw it in the form of a moist paste into a receptacle below. It is then dried in pans, and used as a farina with meat. At Señor Antonio's a plate of tapioca was attached to each of our plates. Some of the pepper was nearly ripe, and of a reddish appearance. When gathered, which it is in April, it is dried in the sun. November 23rd. In the afternoon took leave of my kind friends Señor and Señora Corre. They and the rest came out to the garden gate, and continued looking, till the winding of the road hid me from their sight. 
the poor slave raymond who had attended me and carried my things burst into a flood of tears as we left the door and when i parted from him he was going to kiss my feet but i shook hands with him much affected by such extraordinary kindness in people to whom i had been a total stranger till within a few days what shall i render unto the lord for all his mercies it had lately been announced to the army which was carried in the fleet that they were to be led to attack the cape of good hope then held by the dutch this intelligence which had been kept secret until they were approaching the cape excited mr martin to be more active in the service of these men who were soon to be exposed to the dangers of warfare and many of whom would probably be sent to eternity he observed a day of fasting and prayer in their behalf addressed them from the scriptures whenever he had the opportunity and several were induced to kneel publicly in prayer with him notwithstanding the ridicule and carelessness of a greater part of the crew of soldiers during a season of great sickness on board his ship at which time the captain died he was very useful in attending to the wants of the sick and leading their minds to consider the necessity of preparation for eternity on the last sunday of this year he preached a sermon adapted to their circumstances from second peter chapter three verse eleven seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness in which he endeavoured to impress his hearers with a sense of the importance of religion reminding them of the ways by which providence had been calling them to reflection by the prevalence of disease, the death of their captain, the dangers of the voyage, and the prospect of being engaged in battle. His own mind enjoyed great peace at this time, as is evident from his diary. Separated from my friends and country forever, there is nothing to distract me from hearing the voice of my beloved, and coming away from this world and walking with him in love, amidst the flowers that perfume the air of paradise, and the harmony of the happy, happy saints who are singing his praise. Thus hath the Lord brought me to the conclusion of the year, and though I have broken his statutes, and not kept his commandments, yet he hath not utterly taken away his loving kindness, nor suffered his truth to fail. I thought at the beginning of the year that I should have been in India at this time, if I should have escaped all the dangers of the climate, these dangers are yet to come, but I can leave all cheerfully to God. If I am weary of anything, it is of my life of sinfulness. I want a life of more devotion and holiness, and yet am so vain as to be expecting the end without the means. I am far from regretting that I ever came on this delightful work. Were I to choose for myself, I could scarcely find a situation more agreeable to my taste." On, therefore, let me go, and persevere steadily in this blessed undertaking, through the grace of God, dying daily to the opinions of men, and aiming with a more single eye at the glory of the everlasting God. On the 3rd of January, 1806, the fleet anchored at the Cape, and the army was landed and led to the attack, which commenced early the next morning. As soon as the battle was over, Mr. Martin went on shore, in hopes of being useful to the sufferers. His own account of the scene, in a letter to a friend in England, gives a terrible picture of a field of battle. I embraced the opportunity of getting to the wounded men soon after my landing. A party of the company's troops were ordered to repair to the field of battle, to bring away the wounded, under the command of Major Blank, whom I knew. By his permission I attached myself to them, and marched six miles over a soft burning sand, till we reached the fatal spot. We found several but slightly hurt, and these we left for a while, after seeing their wounds dressed by a surgeon. A little onward were three mortally wounded. One of them, on being asked where he was struck, opened his shirt and showed a wound in his left breast. The blood which he was spitting showed that he had been shot through the lungs. As I spread my greatcoat over him, by the surgeon's desire, who passed on without attempting to save him, I spoke of the blessed gospel, and besought him to look to Jesus Christ for salvation. He was surprised, but could not speak. 
and I was obliged to leave him in order to reach the troops, from whom the officers, out of regard to my safety, would not allow me to be separated. Among several others, some wounded and some dead, was Captain Blank, who was shot by a rifleman. We all stopped for a while to gaze in pensive silence on his pale body, and then passed on to witness more proofs of the sin and misery of fallen man. Descending into the plain, where the main body of each army had met, I saw some of the fifty-ninth, one of whom, a corporal, who sometimes had sung with us, told me that none of the fifty-ninth were killed, and none of the officers wounded. Some farmhouses, which had been in the rear of the enemy's army, had been converted into an hospital for the wounded, whom they were bringing from all quarters. The surgeon told me that they were already in the houses two hundred, some of them were Dutch. A more ghastly spectacle than that which presented itself here I could not have conceived. They were ranged without and within the house, in rows, covered with gore. Indeed, it was the blood which they had not had time to wash off that made their appearance more dreadful than the reality, for few of their wounds were mortal. The confusion was very great and sentries and officers were so strict in their duty that I had no fit opportunity of speaking to any of them, except a Dutch captain with whom I conversed in French. After this I walked out again with the surgeon to the field, and saw several of the enemies wounded. A Hottentot, who had had his thigh broken by a ball, was lying in extreme agony, biting the dust, and uttering horrid imprecations upon the Dutch, I told him that he ought to pray for his enemies, and after telling the poor wretched man of the gospel, I begged him to pray to Jesus Christ. But our conversation was soon interrupted, for in the absence of the surgeon, who was gone back for his instruments, a highland soldier came up and challenged me with the words, "'Who are you?' "'An Englishman.' "'No,' said he, "'you are French,' and began to present his piece. As I saw that he was rather intoxicated— and did not know but that he might actually fire out of mere wantonness, I sprang up towards him and told him that if he doubted my word, he might take me as his prisoner to the English camp, but that I certainly was an English clergyman. This pacified him, and he behaved with great respect. The surgeon, on examining the wound, said the man must die, and so left him. At length I found an opportunity of returning as much as I wished, in order to recover from distraction of mind, and to give free scope to reflection. I lay down on the border of a clump of shrubs or bushes, with the field of battle in view, and there lifted up my soul to God. Mournful as the scene was, I yet thanked God that he had brought me to see a specimen, though a terrible one, of what men by nature are. May the remembrance of this day ever excite me to pray and labor more for the propagation of the gospel of peace. Then shall men love one another. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. The blue mountains to the eastward, which formed the boundary of the prospect, were a cheering contrast to what was immediately before me. For there I conceived my beloved and honored fellow-servants, companions in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, to be passing the days of their pilgrimage, far from the world, imparting the truths of the precious gospel to benighted souls. Note, the Moravian missionaries at Gronkloff and Gnadenthal, and those belonging to the London Missionary Society at Bethelstorp. End note. May I receive grace to be a follower of their faith and patience, and do you pray, my brother, as I know that you do, that I may have a heart more warm, and a zeal more ardent in this glorious cause. On the tenth the fort and town were taken from the Dutch. Whilst the fleet was delayed, Martin visited Dr. Vanderkemp, and the other missionaries at the Cape, and his meeting with them was a source of great joy. From the first moment I arrived, I had been anxiously inquiring about Dr. Vanderkemp, I heard at last, to my no small delight, that he was now in Cape Town. But it was long before I could find him. At length I did. He was standing outside of the house, silently looking up at the stars. A great number of black people were sitting around. 
On my introducing myself, he led me in, and called for Mr. Reed. I was beyond measure delighted at the happiness of seeing him, too. The circumstance of meeting with these beloved and highly honoured brethren so filled me with joy and gratitude for the goodness of God's providence, that I hardly knew what to do. January 14th. Continued walking with Mr. Reed till late. He gave me a variety of curious information respecting the mission. He told me of his marvellous success among the heathen, how he had heard them amongst the bushes pouring out their hearts to God. At all this my soul did magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoiced in God my Saviour. Now that I am in a land where the Spirit of God appears, as in the ancient days, as in the generation of old, let a double portion of that Spirit rest upon this unworthy head, that I may go forth to my work, rejoicing like a strong man, to run my race. January 20th Walking home, I asked Dr. Vanderkemp if he had ever repented of his undertaking. No, said the old man, smiling, and I would not exchange my work for a kingdom. Reed told me of some of his trials. He has often been so reduced for want of clothes as scarcely to have any to cover him. The reasonings of his mind were, I am here, Lord, in thy service. Why am I left in this state? It seemed to be suggested to him, if thou wilt be my servant, be contented to fare in this way. If not, go, and fare better. His mind was thus satisfied to remain God's missionary, with all its concomitant hardships. At night my sinful soul enjoyed a most reviving season in prayer. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord, and pleaded with fervor for the interests of his church. January 30th rose at five, and began to ascend Table Mountain at six, with S and M. I went on chiefly alone. I thought of the Christian life, what uphill work it is, and yet there are streams flowing down from the top, just as there was water coming down by the kloof by which we ascended. Towards the top it was very steep, but the hope of being soon at the summit encouraged me to ascend very lightly. As the kloof opened, a beautiful flame-coloured flower appeared in a little green hollow, waving in the breeze. It seemed to be an emblem of the beauty and peacefulness of heaven, as it shall open upon the weary soul when its journey is finished and the struggles of the deathbed are over. We walked up and down the whole length, which might be between two and three miles, and one might be said to look round the world from this promontory. I felt a solemn awe at the grand prospect, from which there was neither noise nor small objects to draw off my attention. I reflected, especially when looking at the immense expanse of sea on the east, which was to carry me to India, on the certainty that the name of Christ should, at some period, resound from shore to shore. I felt commanded to wait in silence, and see how God would bring his promises to pass. We began to descend at half-past two. Whilst sitting to rest myself towards night, I began to reflect, with death-like despondency, on my friendless condition. Not that I wanted any of the comforts of life, but I wanted those kind friends who loved me, and in whose company I used to find so much delight after my fatigues. And then, remembering that I should never see them more, I felt one of those keen pangs of misery that occasionally shoot across my breast. It seemed like a dream that I had actually undergone banishment from them for life, or rather like a dream that I had ever hoped to share the enjoyments of social life. But at this time I solemnly renewed my self-dedication to God, praying that I might receive grace to spend my days for His service in continued suffering and separation from all I held most dear in this life. Amen. How vain and transitory are those pleasures, which the worldliness of my heart will ever be magnifying into real good! The rest of the evening I felt weaned from the world and all its concerns, with somewhat of a melancholy tranquillity. January 31 from great fatigue of body, was in doubt about going to the hospital, and very unwilling to go. However, I went, 
and preached with more freedom than ever I had done there. Having some conversation with Colonel H., I asked him whether, if the wound he had received in the late engagement had been mortal, his profaneness would have recurred with any pleasure to his mind on a deathbed. He made some attempts at palliation, though in great confusion, but bore the admonition very patiently. February 5th. Rose early, walked out, discouraged at the small progress I make in Eastern languages. My state of bodily and mental indolence was becoming so alarming that I struggled hard against both, crying to God for strength. Notwithstanding the reluctance in my own heart, I went to the hospital and preached on Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28. From this time I enjoyed peace and happiness. Dr. Vanderkemp called to take leave. I accompanied him and Brother Smith out of the town with their two wagons. The dear old man showed much affection, and gave me advice and a blessing at parting. While we were standing to take leave, Coaster, a Dutch missionary, was just entering the town with his bundle, having been driven from his place of residence. Brother Reed also appeared from another quarter, though we thought he had gone to sea. These, with Jons, note, probably the missionary destined for Madagascar, end note, and myself made six missionaries, who, in a few minutes, all parted again. Besides visiting and preaching at the hospital, among the wounded English, he held public service at the house in which he lodged. In February the fleet sailed again. On the 22nd of April, anchored before Madras, and in the middle of May, he landed at Calcutta. End of chapter 5